right, welcome everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. First of all, welcome on behalf of SMU. This is our second leadership lecture. I have the honor of welcoming you as well as welcoming the director of the United States Patent and Trademark Office, Director Andre Iancu. Um, he uh, joined the Patent Office earlier this year, um, nominated by the President, confirmed by the Senate. He's the Under Secretary for Commerce and the Director of the United States Patent and Trademark Office, former Managing Director of the firm Irela Manella in California. And we're so uh, thankful that you're willing to come and speak to us, and welcome. Thank you for the invitation, and uh, great, great to see everybody here. So we're just going to do a question and answer format and uh, prepared some questions in advance and hopefully we'll save some time at the end for questions from the audience. Really overarching uh, uh, question at first. Or actually, before we do that, I wanted to mention, I brought this before I forget. So this is the uh, SMU Science and Technology Law Review from spring 2011. So really I need to say welcome back to Director Yanku because he visited the law school here and um, served as a panelist on a symposium we had seven years ago. In that symposium, we focused on patent litigation, and of course, now we're going to focus on the, the patent office action, so it's a little bit different focus, but welcome back Thank to you. SMU. And I think, uh, as, I was, as I mentioned, I think I was here, in this room, <laughs> up here. Might have been this seat. It's a long time ago, though. <laughs> well, my first question is really an overall question. Um, what's the patent office in your estimation? You've been there about eight months or so. What, what's the patent office doing well? Where does it have room for, I say the patent office, the USPTO does more than patents, but what is it doing well and where's there room for improvement? Right, it is the patent and trademark office, uh, although if you ask the trademark lawyers, it's the USTPO, <laughs> um, but we certainly cannot leave out the T. Uh, and by the way, in addition to patents and trademarks, uh, at the U.S. PTO and in my position, we, um, we handle and we advise the administration on all IP-related issues, including copyright, including trade secret, international issues as well. Uh, so we are the leading agency on all IP-related issues. Um, and that is one of the things that uh, the PTO is doing well. Um, we have almost 13,000 people that are 100% dedicated to intellectual property in the United States. And that is the biggest collection of IP knowledge anywhere uh, in the US uh, for certain. And the depth and history of knowledge is absolutely remarkable. Uh, if you look at the examination side, whether it's patents or trademarks, the dedication of employees there and the length of history employees uh, have there of public servants, uh, most of whom dedicate their lives uh, to this field, is absolutely unbelievable. Uh, we have an amazing retention rate. Uh, we hire um, uh, examiners, both on the patent and trademark side, and the statistics are unbelievable. If uh, basically, if uh, folks make it past the first couple of years, uh, because it, there is an adjustment and whatnot, then it is almost certain that they'll be there uh, for the rest of their careers. Uh, the attrition rate uh, after the first couple of years is extraordinarily small in the low single digits uh, over the entire career of uh, PTO employees. Um, I think uh, the examiners, uh, both patent and trademark side, do a great job at examining. Uh, they, uh, they are uh, very knowledgeable about the subject area that they're in, the technology that they're in. They're constantly learning. We have lots of training programs, both from the inside of the PTO, but also from industry. There is constant training. Uh, we always recommend more training. Uh, so I think they do a good job on that. Um, areas to improve, um, we can talk a lot more about the legal system and the like. Uh, obviously, we can't control or improve court decisions. Um, that's a separate body of government. Um, uh, and uh, we can't really change legislation on our own, so uh, you know, we can, we can uh, work on, on how we administer the laws. Uh, so the main area of improvement to me, on the patent side at least, is the search for prior art. It's a, there is a systemic issue, uh, which is that the amount of art that exists out there uh, is right now large and it keeps growing exponentially. 
Um, and we have had, uh, this is not new, uh, we have had a publication explosion uh, in this country and frankly around the world for the past couple decades, I would say. Um, and the, um, the volume of art, both patent literature and non-patent literature, both domestic and internationally in foreign languages, has grown absolutely dramatically. In the old days, for those of you, um, well, most of you here seem uh, very young and still in school, but for some of us who, well, I don't know about you, for me, <laughs> who's been around for a little while, uh, we remember days when examiners and the public, you would go to what was called a shoe. This was a uh, wood cabinet uh, with drawers uh, that was located in the technology center for the particular technology you're working in, and it had boxes uh, by classification with the prior art. So the examiners were masters of the shoes. Each box was called a shoe. Uh, the examiners were masters of the shoes in their areas. Um, they knew what was in there. They would keep adding, and, but they always knew. That's not possible anymore. That's, that's long gone, and now it's all electronic. Um, so what we really need to work on, I think, are new search techniques, artificial intelligence, uh, which we were just talking about before this meeting, uh, techniques to help examiners uh, and the public surface the most relevant prior art references. Because in the end, if we don't have the most relevant prior art references when we examine a patent, it makes the examination that much more difficult and questionable. So that is, to me, probably the m biggest area of, uh, in the need of improvement in the patent system, not just at the PT USPTO, but worldwide, all, all patent offices. Great, so uh, this, this week, as it turns out, is diversity week at the law school, so I wanted to ask just, what are the diversity initiatives, if any, that the USPTO has? Uh, so the USPTO is a very diverse uh, population. Uh, out of the 13,000, 12,500 or so employees, the vast majority, as you can imagine, are examiners, uh, are in the examination units, um, and uh, we hire uh, folks with technical backgrounds, we have 8,500 uh, patent examiners, uh, all of whom have technical backgrounds, uh, many of whom have legal degrees as well. Um, and we have all sorts of uh, efforts, uh, concerted efforts out there to hire a diverse uh, uh, pool. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. So we have at the PTO what's called affinity groups. So. Um, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, something like 17 affinity groups, thereabouts. Um, and they relate to uh, uh, different areas of, uh, of diversity. Uh, there are several, several, in fact, not just one, several uh, women examiner affinity groups. Uh, there's a veterans or military uh, affinity group. Uh, there is uh, an African-American, at least one, I think a couple uh, affinity groups, and so on. And we engage those groups in our recruiting efforts uh, and in our training efforts uh, to make sure that we reach out and, and uh, speak to the right audiences and encourage them to apply and, uh, and be hired by us. So uh, that's, uh, that's one, just one example. I'll give you an, small, uh, another small example, which is um, on the veteran side, we have uh, made tremendous, we, it's concerted effort in the past five years to hire U.S. Uh, military veterans. And um, uh, using our affinity groups and other efforts uh, has been a tremendously successful program. As a result of all that and the retention, if you look at the overall demographics of the PTO and you compare it, those demographics, with industry, so with uh, the high tech sector or the uh, technical industries, uh, you will see a significantly higher percentage of women, for example, and, uh, and some of the other uh, uh, minority groups uh, because uh, we have a very high retention rate. So, so once they come, they don't leave, unlike in private industry. So on the concept of hiring, and we have a significant number of students here, um, what knowledge and skills would you suggest that law students ought to try to acquire to, be, uh, to prepare them to practice in IP, whether it's as an examiner or based on your extensive experience to be a great attorney in either patent or trademark law? 
Yeah, so before doing this, as, um, as the professor has mentioned, I was the managing partner at the law firm in California, uh, and for some time I was also the hiring partner at, uh, at that law firm. Um, and uh, I would say, first and foremost, study and get good grades. It's number one. It's what I tell my kids too, by the way. Uh, they, they, they don't appreciate that. But um, you'll be surprised how important that is for law firms hiring straight out of law school. It just is a, it's just a fact. Um, but as a general principle, I think what makes great lawyers in the long term are several characteristics. Number one, be invested in your work. It applies to your studies as well. Always stay curious and take ownership of your work, of your cases, of your career. Show a lot of interest and live it. Um, and that translates to, uh, to better work product, to client relationships, and the like. I think employers... Um, so, so when I do interviews, students often ask in interviews, um, uh, what does it take to make partner at this at your law firm? And the mon who knows, there are many, many factors. Nobody ever knows the exact formula. There is no formula, I think, anywhere. But the one factor that I think applies, it definitely applied when I was hiring, and I think it applies at most of the leading law firms, is ownership. Do you demonstrate that you are all in? Are you all in to the work that you do? And this applies especially in IP, uh, because IP is a crossover, especially on the patent side. You have, you have to have a technical interest. You don't necessarily need a technical background, uh, but you have to be interested in technology. You have to not be afraid of it. And you obviously have to be very go good with the law. Um, and you need to... Um, always exhibit the fact that you really love it. And hopefully, to do that, hopefully you do love it. Because it's hard. It's hard work. So um, people that uh, hire you are looking for signs that you are all in. Um, so anyway, that's, that's just one, um, the, main, the main issue in my mind. Other than grades. Grades are not one. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> Great. So I do want to get to patents, but I at least want to talk first about trademarks. So um, I don't know, you can take this any, anywhere you want, but what are some initiatives that the Patent Office has in the area of trademarks? Um, quite a few. Now, uh, let me just first begin by saying that uh, the trademark operation at the PTO is doing phenomenally well. For the last 12 years or so, uh, the trademark operation has hit or exceeded all of its benchmarks. Uh, our pendency rates are down. Uh, uh, our, our stakeholders are very happy with our pendency rates. Uh, we can get applications out in less than a year. And by the way, that's different from the patent side, although uh, their pendency rates on the patent side have gone dr down dramatically as well. Um, if you ask our stakeholders on the patent side, they would like to see significantly more improvements on that. But on the trademark side, people are quite happy. Uh, with that. Um, major uh, initiatives. So, um, uh, although for the past six months or so we've been focusing a lot more on the patent side and we can come to that, uh, there are significant initiatives on the uh, trademark side as, as well. Um, from an operational point of view, uh, one thing that has uh, happened is that we have experienced tremendous growth on the trademark side in the past uh, several years, year over year. Tremendous growth. Um, a lot of it driven by applications from China. We have had in the past six years alone an increase of 1100% in application, trademark applications from China. 1100%. Uh, that and together with a growing and robust US economy and when you have a robust economy, there's more entrepreneurship and therefore more trademark applications, likewise more patent applications, but trademark is a leading indicator there. Uh, that combination has led to tremendous growth. Um, and that is somewhat of a challenge. You know, we need to hire more people. Uh, we need to train them at much faster clips. Um, 
and it's especially more difficult to hire in a booming economy because you all want to go and uh, make money and, and all that, and you were competing with, uh, with a robust um, market, all of which is uh, it's, it's a really good problem to have. Um, so we're addressing, uh, we're addressing that, the training, the hiring, the integrating of a, uh, of a, of a new workforce. Uh, on the substantive, um, uh, and also let me just address uh, just briefly on the applications from China. Um, one thing that we're looking at is to require a local U.S. lawyer uh, present in your case for filing for foreign filing, filers of trademark applications at the USPTO. So if you are a foreign filer of a trademark application at the USPTO, we would require a US licensed lawyer to represent you before us. Uh, that is something that's in the works, we're thinking about it, uh, and we're uh, contemplating a, uh, promulgating a rule uh, to, to effectuate that. Um, on the uh, substantive side, the trademark register is quite cluttered. Uh, there's so many applications and they have collected over the years um, and it's caused some clutter on, uh, on, on the register. That makes it difficult for new entrants, more legitimate entrants perhaps. Uh, so we're looking at ways of decluttering the register and I'll stop there because that's very technical and we can spend a lot of time on that. Okay, thank you. So. Transitioning to think about patents, the last, one of the last uh, strategic plans for the USPTO identified the goals of optimizing patent quality and timeliness. And so how's the USPTO doing with respect to those goals and what um, perhaps different strategic goals do you, might you have going forward? So um, with respect to timeliness, there have been uh, uh, dramatic improvements. As I said, uh, our uh, average pendency now is less than 24 months. Um, and it keeps going down. Our first office action pendency, um, I believe it's around five, 15 months, uh, give or take a month, I forget the exact number, but it's down as well year over year and has been going, going down for a few years and will keep going down uh, as well. It will never go to zero or one or th three months. Uh, there's an optimum uh, number of uh, months for pendency. Uh, we're getting close to the optimum number. Uh, we're not quite there yet. So uh, great strides in that, uh, from that respect. Quality is an interesting question. There is a question of how do you measure quality? Um, and there are no real agreed upon metrics for measuring quality. Different people have different points of view. We have our own quality measures and, and, and standards within the PTO. So just as an example, we have uh, significantly increase the number of second looks at a particular application or office action from the PTO. An examiner issues an office action um, and for quality check we have a second independent look at the work product of the examiner. So we've increased dramatically the number of those second looks and we can measure how many times the second look disagrees with the first uh, uh, work product by the examiner. And those numbers have been improving dramatically as well on all areas measured. And we measure the areas by statute. Uh, 102 for novelty, 103 obviousness, 101 and so on, 112. Um, so anyway, so we made the improvements there. Um, I am not certain, to be frank, that those are the correct measures. Uh, they're a measure um, of, of uh, quality. Ultimately, the real test is when a patent is challenged, whether it's in court or in back at the PTO for a post-grant proceeding of some sort. And that's all to, does the patent withstand that challenge down the line? To me, that's the ultimate test. Um, and the statistics there uh, vary, you know, and um, uh, vary by jurisdiction and uh, different people have different points of view on those statistics. But um, uh, I think improvements need to be made, frankly, with respect to that. So timeliness and quality, those were, I think, past uh, strategic goals. Are there any different strategic? I mean, obviously, timeliness and 
quality are probably ongoing strategic goals, but any new strategic goals? They are ongoing goals. Uh, if you look at our new strategic plan, uh, they still remain on the strategic plan. Um, the, uh, but I, you know, as I came into this function uh, in February and even before during my confirmation hearing, um, I want to be a bit more concrete about it, right? So, uh, again, quality is, is a very different, very difficult metric. And I want to speak in terms of, I think the lingo uh, needs to change a little bit, and I want to speak in terms of reliability and predictability. Are the patents reliable? That you can measure a little bit along the ways that I just mentioned, right? You can look at how does the patent perform in a challenge down the line, so uh, and predictable. And when we get to section 101, which I'm sure is probably, everybody has questions on 101, <laughs> that was one of the biggest uh, concerns about predictability. So we want to you know, increase predictability, increase reliability. So those um, phrases have made their way now into our strategic plan as well. Uh, and we have other major points, which is it's very important for us to have a great work environment. This is not perhaps so important for the public, but you know, for our 13,000 employees at the PTO, it's really important. And we have, as, uh, as one of the major uh, strategic goals, is to be one of the best places to work for in government. And I think we are, uh, for a large agency. So before we get to 101, because it is going to be a topic of conversation, but in August, I understand the US PTO experienced a system outage. And Locally here we know about system outages with respect to certain internet providers and <laughs> website providers even before that. Um, fires and floods apparently um, have effect. Um, what have you learned from that outage? What's the USPTO's future plans with respect to IT infrastructure? The main thing I learned from that outage is that I don't like it. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it was not a good time. It took, uh, it, it took us a week to get, uh, to get back on approximately. and. Um, uh, the main lesson, and I am not kidding, the main lesson is that we really have to reduce the likelihood of that happening again. It will happen. There, every system has outage, outages. We just have to make sure that they are uh, fewer and further in between. And we have to make sure that when we do go down, we can get back up uh, significantly faster. The fact of the matter is that we work at the PTO and in most of government with uh, old legacy systems. Um, and there's many reasons for that. But <clears throat> I think at the PTO, um, we, uh, it is time, it is in fact well beyond time to modernize our IT infrastructure. And I have committed the agency to, uh, uh, to modernize the, uh, the IT infrastructure. Uh, we're taking a fresh look right now, um, uh, top to bottom. Uh, nothing is off the table, and we want uh, state-of-the-art technology. Um, so we're, we, we we're working on this internally, but we are also working with the top outside consultants. Uh, certain work has already begun. I'll give you a couple examples, but much more work remains to be done, and I think this is one of the highest priorities uh, for the PTO and other, uh, obviously, other government agencies. Um, in this outage, the main culprit for the outage was uh, corruption in one of our main databases. Uh, and we found almost 200 tables uh, experienced corruption. Um, and the, uh, the, the uh, servers on which this database was located uh, were very old servers. So one of the benefits, if we can call it a benefit, but one of the benefits of the outage was that um, in fixing it, and we did take, it, it took a week, but you know, it purposely took a little bit longer than otherwise would have, because we used that time to migrate to newer servers. So we obsoleted the servers that caused the problem. Uh, we, we didn't just try to fix those. Those are done, we're not using them anymore. We've migrated that particular database to brand new, um, well, to newer servers, and we now also have uh, redundancy for that database. So those were improvements for that particular database that we managed to do at the same time. We're also in the process right now at um, uh, obsoleting and 
migrating to a brand new server, uh, another one of our major uh, databases. Uh, but this is just the beginning. We have a huge system and um, uh, we're, we need to do a lot more. All right, so th I think there's two main areas of reform that at least I see from the outside right now, right now in the area of patent law. The first er uh, area of reform is practice in front of the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, the PTAB. So I'll have a, a, a number of questions related to that, but first I guess, how is practice in front of the PTAB changing under your leadership? Uh, so several things with respect uh, to PTAB, and it does go to the question of reliability and predictability in the patent system. Uh, so first of all, when we say in terms of this audience, PTAB, folks understand and... I think so, right? Yes. PTAB, patent anyway, trial. Anyway, if, if people, patent trial and appeal board, if we get, if I get too technical, please uh, interrupt. Um, uh, and we're talking, so the PTAB, the Patent Trial and Appeal Board has two main functions. One is appeals from regular prosecution, and in fact, that is approximately two-thirds of the work that's being done at the PTAB, regular ex parte appeals from ex parte regular prosecution. Um, that work doesn't get that much publicity and um, uh, media interest, uh, but the other third of the docket, maybe a bit more, uh, deals with uh, what we, what, what's called trials, uh, post-grant proceedings. So IPRs, inter-parties reviews, PGRs, and CBMs. Those were instituted in 2012 from the America Invents Act. Um, we've already seen come through more than 8,000 petition, petitions in the past uh, six years um, on the trial side, mostly on the IPR side, very few PGRs and CBMs. So what are some of the significant changes? But before we get there, let me just say that the PTAB, the trial side, the AIA proceedings, have come under significant criticism in the past five years, primarily from patent owner groups who believe that the system is unfair and perhaps unbalanced. Um, and that their patents are being challenged multiple times. Um, and there have been some reasons, and, con and, and uh, both real and perceived, uh, matters of perception and actual matters of substance that have caused this, uh, this issue. So I do think, and I said from the beginning, from my confirmation hearing, that I think we need to bring s some balance to those, uh, to the uh, additional balance to those uh, proceedings. So uh, some of the things that we have done. Um, first and foremost, we just changed the claim construction standard for patents in our AIA trials to match the claim construction standard that is being used in district court litigation or at the ITC, and that is the Article Three Court construction standards as enunciated by the Supreme Court in the Phillips uh, case and its progeny. So we're gonna have the same claim construction standard. Um, more than 80%, something like 86% of our patents that we see in post-grant proceedings have parallel litigation. So to have these patents, same patents, almost at the same time in two different bodies get two different constructions is odd and causes, in my view, um, unpredictability. Because the fundamental question, the first question one needs to answer about a property right is what are the boundaries of my property? What, where is the fence of my patent? How far does it go? That's got to be question number one when I need to invest in technology surrounding this patent? Or for the public who wants to know whether they need to license that technology or whether they need to invent around it, they need to know what are the boundaries. And it just cannot be, in my view, it just cannot be that the boundaries of your property depend on the happenstance of which tribunal rules first at some point in the future. That causes unpredictability um, of, of the system. 
So we went through rulemaking right now. We received huge numbers of comments for us, 375 or so comments uh, from the public. Uh, more, so, more comments than it, for anything else ever at the PTO, as far as uh, folks remember. And um, based on all those comments, uh, we have uh, now finalized the rule and published it a couple of weeks ago. It will be, or maybe a week ago, and it will begin to be uh, used with petitions that are filed on November 13th and thereafter. So that's, uh, that, that's an important change. Uh, second, we have changed uh, or amended or updated the trial practice guide. It was uh, initially formulated when AIA was uh, first started in September 2012. Hadn't been amended since. We have now amended it. Um, and there's several new provisions for AIA trials, uh, such as surreplies are now allowed. Uh, there is going to be a pre-hearing conference to narrow the issues. Uh, there are certain uh, factors to consider for the institution decision as to whether to deny the institution uh, because, for example, the same patent was challenged before uh, by the petitioner uh, and, uh, and the like. Um, and we are now working on an amendment process. Um, and uh, we're hoping to have an announcement on, an amendment, on amendments um, fairly soon. The statute itself uh, calls for amendments in the statute. Just says, to clarify, you're talking about amendments to claims that are part of an IPR proceeding. Yes, sorry. So amendments to claims. So claims that come are challenged in an IPR proceeding or PGR before the PTAB. Um, the PTAB can do one of three things in the final written decision. Affirm the patentability of those claims or reject those claims and find them unpatentable, that's an all or nothing approach, or affirm the pat patentability of an amended claim, a narrowing of that uh, challenged claim. So far, the systems that we've had in place for the past six years have yielded in very few amendments um, for a host of reasons that we don't have time for today, but a host of reasons. Peti uh, patent owners generally tend not to seek amendments, and of the motions for amendment that have been made, the ma vast majority have been denied by the board. Uh, so we're trying to change all that and have a more robust uh, amendment process. And so let me follow up on that because th on the one hand with the claim construction standard, you're making PTAB trials more like federal district court where there could be an invalidity challenge. But of course in federal district court, you're not allowed to amend patent claims and you are allowed to amend, at least to some extent, amend patent claims in these PTAB trials. And that was actually the justification for, I think, the broadest reasonable construction standard that was used in the, in the PTAB trial. So I know the Federal Circuit has a decision where they've um, required, I guess, the, the PTAB trials to more liberally allow claim amendments, but it, there seems to be some inconsistency with respect to amendments and the claim construction standards. So I wanted to ask what you thought, of, am I right or wrong? Well, you can tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> well, you know, you know I, I, um, the, the fact is that uh, these are issued patents that are being challenged. Uh, so there's a balance we have to strike here. Um, the statute did, did not mandate a particular claim construction standard, uh, but it did mandate the possibility of amendments. So, uh, and we have to strike a balance. Um, putting amendments to the side for a minute and just thinking about the original claims. The first question is, again, what's the claim construction standard for those claims? And the, for the reasons I just mentioned, uh, we believe that it should be the same standard as in the district courts for consistency, predictability, all the reasons I've mentioned. That's for the original claims. And um, uh, in the end, these are issued claims. So, so at some point, there, uh, there has to be some sense of, uh, of quiet title and uh, defined boundaries. Um, so now, if you're going to have um, uh, that's if you're going to interpret the issued claims in that way, the next question is, what standard will you use to interpret the amended claims? And as you 
as, as you correctly identify, amended claims are a bit different. They are more, perhaps, some people can argue, more perhaps like examination and not necessarily as much like, like litigation. That's an argument. I can make the opposite argument as well. But um, even so, there's a balance that needs to be stricken. Think about the practical considerations. And by the way, for those of you who don't know, in prosecution, we use the broadest reasonable interpretation. Okay? So the question is, for the amended claims, should we, for those, use the broadest reasonable interpretation because, under this particular argument, they are more like prosecution. And for now, what our rule says is that, no, we're going to give them the same construction standard as the original claims during post-grant proceedings. And the reason for that, there are many reasons, but one of them is just practicality. Imagine two claims in the same patent. You have the original claim and an amendment of that claim. So you give the original claim the Phillips construction, which is perhaps narrower, and here you have an amended claim with perhaps many overlapping terms. You're supposed to give it a different construction, and by the way, a broader construction, because by law, the amended claim has to be narrower. So now, you might have the same term in the same patent, in the same proceeding, get two different constructions, with the one in the amended claim getting a broader construction, which would be counter to law, because that claim in itself has to be narrower than the original claim. It would create a complete morass in my mind. There are many other reasons as well. In the end, I do think that even the amended claims are more like uh, the original claims uh, in litigation, because they are issued, they're just a narrowing of those issued claims. So for all those reasons, we're thinking for now that they should all get the same treatment. One other aspect of the reform related to the PTAB that I wanted to ask you about is the Supreme Court's recent decision in SAS Institute versus Bianchi, you, uh, <laughs> named party in the lawsuit. Very unfair naming. I'm just, the naming conventions, totally unfair. It's where the Supreme Court said that um, partial institution is contrary to the statute. So I'm wondering if there uh, is any rulemaking or other response by the Patent Office to that decision. Uh, no, no, I don't think we need rulemaking. First of all, so the holding, uh, so the statute says that the panel needs to issue a final written decision on any, on any of the petitioned claims. And the Supreme Court has held that the word any means all. Okay? So when you go to a restaurant and you tell the waiter, I'll have any item on your menu, <laughs> they will bring to you the entire menu. Um, be that as it may, that is the holding, and we're going to follow the holding uh, faithfully. Um, so uh, I don't think we need uh, rulemaking. We will uh, obviously now um, uh, institute and therefore give a final ruling on all the petitioned claims. Uh, the additional thing that we have done is because when the case came out, a whole host uh, of uh, proceedings were midstream. For the proceedings that were midstream, we went back and we added into them all the original petition claims. Uh, even though we hadn't instituted up front, we now went back and we added them in. It has caused uh, significant additional work for those judges involved in those cases. Uh, but we think it's a localized uh, effect. Uh, it, it, uh, those additional cases will eventually make them their way through the system. Um, so, so we're handling, uh, we're not having, uh, bottom line is we're not having any issues with that. All right, I mentioned there were two areas of reform, at least from my perspective. The first being uh, what we've been talking about, the PTAB. The second, uh, I, I would say at least an area ripe for reform is the issue of patent eligibility. And let me just say, my re recent research efforts, in fact, my last five uh, articles I've written have all been about patent eligibility, so this is near and dear to my heart, so that's why I wanted to focus on it. 
But uh, in particular, I focused on the, what I view as a need for legislative reform and uh, analyzing potential reform in the issue, on, on the area of patent eligibility. As it turns out, I also served as a reporter for the uh, AIPLA, the America Intellectual Property Law Association's Patent Eligibility Task Force, which is one of the national groups that issued a report calling for legislative reform in the area of patent eligibility. Um, I know the USPTO is not Congress, so you can't change uh, the statute. But nevertheless, I've read your recent speeches. You have commented on and made some, I think, proposed changes in this area. So what do you view are the problems in this area and what exactly are you proposing? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Just to speak about the problems. Yeah. Um, well, okay, so um, this is uh, one of the most important areas for the patent system right now. Every uh, stakeholder that I meet with uh, says that we must do something, we, the community, must do something about Section 101 in the current state. I do believe that there is consensus, which is rare in patent law, but I do believe there is, con generally speaking, oh, there's always exceptions, but generally speaking, I think there is consensus that something needs to be done. There is not an agreement at all as to what should be done, but people agree that something needs to be done. The, there are several significant issues with the current state of 101. The main ones relating to abstract ideas. There are issues on natural phenomena and diagnostics uh, as well, uh, but the main problem arises around abstract ideas. Um, and the problem with the abstract idea, jurisprudence, is that it's abstract. And, uh, and people don't really know where the lines are. People don't really know what the courts mean when they issue their various cases. So, um, just to be clear, the abstract idea test says that if what you're claiming is an abstract idea, you're not entitled to a patent. Right, so Section 101 actually provides affirmatively the four categories of patent eligibility. Process, machine, manufacture, composition of matter. That statute was written in 1793 by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. It's the same statute. They were looking at the, er the technologies available then, and they said, okay, these are the four categories. Technology has changed a little bit since, and there's been no legislative action at all vis-a-vis -vis the substance of Section 101 since 1793. Instead, what's happened is that the courts have found exceptions from those four categories. And there are three exceptions, natural phenomena, um, products of nature, and abstract ideas. Did I get that right? Products of nature? I uh, think so. Law of nature. Law of nature. Law of nature. Um, so, and abstract, so okay, so on the abstract idea pro prong, the question is what is exactly an abstract idea, okay? The Supreme Court has given, as far as I can tell, two examples over the 200 year period of abstract ideas. Number one, mathematical expressions. Actually, three examples. Number one, mathematical expressions by themselves not applied, per se math, additions, subtractions, calculus, okay, by itself. Number two, um, mental processes, things that are done just in your uh, head. Uh, and number three, certain human interactions, and the pri primary example there is economic principles, economic transactions between humans, such as escrow accounts or hedge, uh, hedging uh, schemes. That's it from the Supreme Court. But then the lower courts have found many other things as abstract. And sometimes those things are abstract in some cases, and sometimes in other cases, they're not abstract. So for example, just to pick an example without imbuing with it with any spe special meaning, just as an example, computer databases. Computer databases as subject matter, in some cases they're abstract, and in some cases, they're not abstract. And examiners who get these claims by the hundreds and the thousands every year, every day, brand new claim, new database claim, 
They're supposed to say, okay, this is more like this case or it's more like that case. It's extraordinarily difficult. And it's very difficult for practitioners and inventors. That's the biggest problem. And what I think the original sin here, if there is such a thing but in this area, but if there, the original sin is the commingling of subject matter eligibility, 101, with the criteria for patentability, 102, 103, 112. So if it's a matter of claiming, if you can fix the claim by making it narrower, by making it more specific, or by something else, by adding steps, then that's a claiming problem. That is a patentability problem. Probably 103, uh, 112, but maybe 103, okay? It's a hint that if something is sometimes, if subject matter is sometimes eligible and sometimes ineligible, it's a hint that the subject matter doesn't have a problem. It's eligible. The problem is in the way you've claimed it and rejected based on the statutory claiming functions. The things that the Supreme Court have told us are clearly and always abstract are things that are abstract by themselves always, per se. So a good example of this would be calculus, okay? If Newton or, or Leipzig, whoever came first, let's say Newton came first. <laughs> Newton comes first, gives you his book of calculus, and it is clearly new, in our example here, in our hypothesis, clearly new, nobody, it's brilliant, not, not obvious in any way, and it's excruciatingly detailed. It's very detailed. It's flies with perfect colors under 112 as well. So it, it's clearly patentable under 102, 103, and 112. It is still not eligible under 101 because it's just pure math. It doesn't do anything. It's not applied. So uh, you cannot, that's an example of a category that cannot be fixed by claiming. That's what you reject under 101. The rest of the stuff, and then the same thing with economic principles and the same thing with mental steps. And the same thing with nature, DNA, or, or blood, or gravity. You can't, you cannot fix gravity by claiming. Gravity by itself, or electromagnetism by itself, will never be eligible. Those are the things that need to be kicked out with 101. The rest of the stuff, kill it if you need to kill it, with 102, 103, if it's too broad, kill it with 103 or 102. Show me the prior art. The reason we have 102, 103, and 112 from this 1952 act is so you can tell the people why something is not, eligible, not patentable. So you can, you can reject it, but tell us why. Not novel, not uh, or obvious, or it's got a claiming problem. It's, 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 it's indefinite. Well, fix it that way. So those are the major problems with 101. And to fix it, it's uh, what we have proposed in the speech I uh, gave at the IPO two weeks ago, is along the lines that I have just mentioned. Identify the categories that by themselves, per se, are always not eligible. And it's the three that I've mentioned. Math, human interaction, certain human interactions, and mental steps. If you're in those, you do more analysis in 101. But if you're not in those, if your claim doesn't present one of those three things, you're done with 101. And now focus on 102, 103, and 112. That's the gist of it. There's significantly more to it, but given the time, I'll stop there. <laughs> Great, thank you. So I had a follow-up question on section 101. Obviously, I've done some research. So I, I'm recently was studying the 1952 Patent Act, and so um, then Commissioner of Patents, Lawrence C. Kingsland, gave P.J. Federico, then the Examiner-in-Chief and the member of the Patent Office's Board of Appeals at the time, leave for six months to serve as a technical assistant to go over to the House Committee that was writing patent reform legislation or codification legislation, and ultimately he drafted the legislation that led to the Patent Act of 1952, 
And so my question is, is there any thought of having someone at the USPTO serve in a similar role, drafting patent eligibility reform legislation more generally? What is the USPTO's role with respect to patent reform legislation? Yeah, first of all, we're not sending our commissioner for patents. That's, that's <laughs> out. He's very busy managing 8,500. I think they had like seven examiners at the time, so he, he probably could go. But, uh, um, but it's a very good question. We are heavily involved. Um, so what, uh, the, several ways, but the, mo mo the, the most direct ways, we have detailees on Capitol Hill, PTO employees who work for um, senators or congresspeople. Um, and uh, we have them placed now and for a while with a variety of members of Congress. And indeed, it is those folks that are looking at exactly this issue. Um, so, so that is actually happening. Um, um, overall, right now, I have not taken a position as to whether legislation is needed uh, or what that legislation should be, and, uh, and therefore the PTO hasn't taken a position. Uh, what I have said is that if um, Congress decides to take up the issue, uh, and they have hearings or they're trying to draft legislation or the like, we would obviously uh, more than happily participate and participate in, uh, in force. Um, there are several very serious legislative proposals right now. Um, the Intellectual Property Owners Association, the American um, Intellectual Property Lawyers Association, AIPLA, the American Bar Association, the IP section of the ABA, They've all proposed uh, legislation, and they are actively lobbying, as we speak, uh, on Capitol Hill and with us at the PTO uh, on behalf of that legislation. When will it be introduced or any such? Uh, if would, I don't know. It's not going to be this Congress, obviously. Um, uh, but we might see some action, at least maybe some hearings in 2019. My follow-up question on that is, uh, what about the patent bar? So in 1952, for example, P.J. Federico was assisted by what they called the drafting committee, included Giles Rich and Paul Rose, but there was a larger, what they called a coordinating committee, including various leaders from various IP bar associations around the country, as well as government um, um, leaders and, and different people that had an interest in patent reform. So my question is, in what ways might the patent bar today support the USPTO's efforts to solve some of these problems in patent law? Well, uh, they're doing it. Uh, first of all, just to begin with, the types of events we've had today, like we did just before this meeting with industry, meetings with all of you and academia, um, the associations that I've mentioned, IPO, AIPLA, ABA, um, advocate, uh, come up with ideas, publish, as you do, um, uh, we read the stuff, uh, legislators read the stuff, um, and advocate publicly, uh, convene discussions uh, where ideas can be surfaced. It's all very, very valuable, and the more of it uh, that we do, uh, the better. Uh, I can't emphasize enough the importance of publishing, uh, not, not, not just in law reviews, which not everybody reads, but... Uh, <laughs> There are just a few exceptions. <laughs> uh, the SMU one, everybody reads this one. <laughs> Other than that. But anyway, but um, uh, publishing in the popular media, uh, shorter op-ed pieces in the Washington Post, in the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, they are willing to publish in this area. Uh, it obviously has to be a concise message, a clear message that's accessible uh, to a broader audience. It is so important because we all read the same stuff, right? So um, the legislators, the judges, we at the PTO, we read the same articles. Uh, so to the extent uh, you're all interested in participating and uh, emphasizing your points of view, that is a great avenue. Great, so we have about four minutes by my <laughs> clock. Um, so I do wanna open it up to questions from the audience. So if you have a question for the director, if you would um, go ahead and stand up and Ask your question. Yes. Uh, follow up question on the one issue. It seems to me it is sort of a core created problem. Is now that you have some examination guidelines around 101, is there any thought that the office would go 
go out and urge those in the course directly, like for example, an amicus violence or something like that. Yeah, it's a very good question. So the question is, what about the court system? Um, we're going to issue patents pursuant perhaps to the new guideline. Just as an aside, the new guidelines haven't come out yet. Um, we're working it through the various administrative agencies, but um, uh, if they come out, um, we issue patents under this new guidance, what will the courts do about them? Because they're an independent judiciary, obviously. Uh, the answer is I don't know what, what they will do. I think... Um, what I described is a correct synthesis of the law. Hopefully they'll agree, uh, but we'll certainly advocate there. We have a solicitor's office that has about 60 lawyers at the PTO. That's what they do. Um, and um, we'll do it from our own cases, but we will intervene in the appropriate uh, cases as well at the federal circuit. Um, and we're active at the Supreme Court. And the Department of Justice uh, is likewise keen on this issue. So yeah, so if, if, um, uh, if the new guidelines are issued and uh, we'll look for opportunities to advocate uh, in the court system for sure. Um, one of the technologies that Jefferson and Madison did not have to contemplate was artificial intelligence. Hmm. Is an idea, if you will, that's created through AI, an idea created by a machine, a mental process or a mental step to the exception. Yeah, it's a fascinating question. Uh, and again, we met with industry, the professor and I and a number of others just before this meeting. That question came up. Uh, it's, it's very complex. I don't have an answer for you. Uh, the, um, and there's so many more layers to that, to that question. Um, at some point, computer programs will create new computer or new things. Uh, already they do some of that, right? So what happens when innovation is uh, created by a machine? Um, uh, is it eligible? And then who owns it? Uh, and so many other questions. Um, and again, unfortunately, I don't have answers to that, but we are working on it. And the whole world is working on it. The major IP offices, uh, Europe, uh, China, Japan, Korea, and us, of course, are actively working on it. We're having, the Europeans had a symposium on this exact issue uh, a few months ago. We are having one at the US PTO, where the major offices are coming um, uh, th this fall. So we're working on it, and I apologize. I don't have a direct answer right now. But uh, we're aware of the questions. So, all right. I think unfortunately, I could. I have many more questions. I'm sure you do too. But in light of time, take at least uh, you want to take. From, you want to take one more. Student, though, okay, good. Has to, be a student. has to be a student. All right. All right. Well, I'm looking for a student. Yeah, <laughs> I recognize you. You're not a student, and we need a student to ask a question. Yes. <laughs> no. Okay? Close enough. <laughs> Thank you. So the question is, uh, are we doing anything to improve the appeal process at the PTO uh, from ex parte prosecution? Um, it, it is a lengthy process. I actually think the process itself is a good one. We have a pre-appeal conference and the judges are very experienced. Uh, however, um, it is a lengthy process. And I am very much focused on reducing the pendency of the appeal pr appellate process. It has already gone down, and it's uh, the backlog of appeals, uh, which is in the thousands, um, uh, over 10,000, it, it, it is, is high, and, uh, but it's gone down dramatically, uh, and we're looking to reduce that. So we're putting the resources into that side of the PTAB, and um, we're working to reduce pendency, 
uh, and reduce the backlog even further. I think that once uh, the appellate process gets to around 12 months or so, um, I think that is um, a pretty de decent, um, more or less, uh, uh, pendency time. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, it, I think it's what people sort of is expect, uh, but we have a ways to go, but we're working on it. So. All right, please join me in thanking Director Iancu. Thank you.